Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Lance Lucas, and it is my pleasure to host you all this afternoon for tea time with the ambassador of Botswana and our very, very special guest, the minister, the honorable minister Dorcas. This week, we've had the pleasure of hosting a delegation from Botswana to talk about business opportunities in Atlanta, and we thought it so appropriate to have an event just for women, given that when you look at their leadership, it is stacked from the top, the middle, and the bottom with women. When we consider what Atlanta represents and the powerful women that we also have in Atlanta, we wanted to bring you all together today to have a conversation, a tea time with the ambassador, to talk about how she was able to achieve what she did, and also Minister, the Honorable Minister Dorcas. Their paths have been different, significant, and of course, as women, we confront very, very similar issues. So as we get started with the tea, we're gonna start by having a blessing by Pastor Natasha. Christ. It is my honor to be here today on behalf of Bishop Barbara Lewis King, who was scheduled to be with you today, but who had a transition service in California. So she sends her regrets. She is a woman who very much loves Africa, and it always makes it very evident in our services at Hillside. So let us begin just by taking a moment to just be still. Let's just take a moment to just close our eyes and recognize within ourselves all the beauty that exists in this space, in our lives, in the world, in our hearts. And let's just give thanks together for this divine moment, a moment where we come together to recognize that within each and every one of us is a divine spark that is wanting to come alive, to be a light, to be a beacon, so that other women and men and children can all see, so that they can experience the freedom of doing all that they're meant to do. We give thanks for this delegation. We give thanks for the Honorable Minister Dorcas and the powerful work that is being done in Botswana women who are leading the way in democracy, women who are leading the way with new ideas and new ways of being. And we give thanks that we have the opportunity this day to dine, to be at tea with these women so that we can share all the glory that God has for each and every one of us and that we can come together and we can create a world where everyone knows that God is beautiful, divine, and loves each and every one of his children. So we give thanks for our time together. We give thanks for the meal together. We give thanks for the fellowship, and we give thanks for the love that overwhelms us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Just a few housekeeping items. I want to make sure that we recognize our host committee. Would you please stand so we can recognize you and appreciate you? <laughs> Ramia Burbank from Detroit, Michigan. Judge Asha Jackson, raise your hand. And council member Keisha Lance Bottoms. Thank you very much. Before we serve the tea, I'd like to introduce our conversationalist for this afternoon. Mo Ivory of the Mo Ivory Show will conduct the conversation um, that we will have this afternoon after we serve tea. And until that time, we want you all just to enjoy, enjoy the tea, enjoy the pedophores, and enjoy one another. We're going to turn it over to Mo Ivory for the conversation piece of this afternoon with Ambassador Seretse and the Honorable Minister Dorcas. 
And what we will do is this is our time to connect. Right, and what we're going to do is we're just going to rewind all the way to the very first question so that everybody will have the, we're going to get to know you really, really well, Minister. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> and we're going to rewind for everybody that didn't get an opportunity. The question that we started off with was, what was it like growing up as a little girl in Botswana? And how did you get to the position that you're in today? And the minister is going to repeat her response to that for the benefit of everybody. Thank you. Well, I'll just oblige because in our culture we have uh, a saying that says the words that are spoken are in the eyes of the one that speaks. Mm -hmm. That's the exact translation. So I think it's better that at least you are able to relate to the person that you are speaking to. Uh, quickly, I grew up in Botswana, went to school in Botswana, only left to go for my tertiary in the United Kingdom sponsored by Debtswana Debtswana, which is a partnership, it's a company, part, a partnership between the government of Botswana and DBS, 50-50%. I benefited from a scholarship that I competed for and got. Uh, from the UK, I went back to serve my time with the mine. I worked for them for five years, which was the exact amount of time I needed to, to work for them in order for them to release me to go into other things. I then left, joined the airline, became commercial manager of our national airline. I did that job for about three years. I then resigned again, left, uh, joined the biggest uh, private sector holding group in Botswana known as Balo World, but it is a global company. You can Google Balo World. At the time, I think the size was about 350,000 employees worldwide. But by the time I left, I think we were only 23,000 because we had to unbundle. We had to go through an unbundling exercise. I then left and got a job as CEO of Botswana Export Development and Investment Authority, which is a parastatal. I was there for about 18 months into my contract when I got a call from the president who asked me to come and serve. He nominated me into parliament so that I can then become a, a minister of trade and industry, which is the job that I'm doing today. So there's two ways in which you can do the job that I do. You can stand uh, and, and win an election, go to parliament, then be nominated by the head of state, assuming you're in the right party, and then become um, a minister holding a, any portfolio. But I was brought in really for my technical expertise in terms of understanding how industry works, having been there, done that, got the t-shirt type of thing. And that is basically where I am today. But I have said to the president that next time I'll come in in my own right. In my own right means I am going to go there and fight for, <laughs> for a constituency. And um, I will not launch my, my campaign here. I wish I could. Uh, there are rules that I have to abide by. But um, uh, it, it would be nice for the women of Atlanta to start this uh, wonderful campaign, you know, but it's not allowed. Uh, so uh, when, when it is allowed, I will stand in 2014, and I know that I will win. And then, you know, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mo. Uh, first and foremost, uh, good afternoon, beautiful ladies. You look gorgeous. Uh, I want to extend my thanks to our hosts for this afternoon who have made all of this possible. And also to thank in a special way Ms. Adrienne Lance Lucas, who uh, has been slaving for me for the last three months to, to just make sure that the conference we are running up to this, everything just falls in place. But in our language, we have a saying that don't accept my thanks, you'll be thanked by God. That would be the, the better thanks than the ones that I can utter with my mouth, and thanks to Ms. M and to Mr. Allen for letting us come and share this very beautiful facility with them. And I'm sold for the time I'm in Atlanta. This is going to be my home because I, I love to take my morning walks and this is just uh, the lovely place that it would be. I am from a family of four, being the second child uh, but I lost an elder sister, so now I am the oldest. I have a younger sister and a younger brother. Grew up in a village where um, Dorcas's mother originates from. So if it was not for protocol, she'd be calling me auntie. But, uh, you know, um, <laughs> she is... Uh, 
she is my boss, and I hope uh, when we leave here, she won't take me to task about this. I was just stating a fact. Uh, I did my primary education in this village. A lot of the other Africans, when they go to our country, Botswana, and they see what we call village, they say, how could you call this place a village when there's electricity, when there's running water, where there are schools, where there are hospitals? So I guess they are villages because they are not declared towns. I believe for a place to be declared a town, it must have X number of village, X number of people. But they are, they are the villages uh, playing in debt, not having toys like your typical African child. And uh, during my primary, I come from a family which has always run business. And my mother, she worked until her very last. So we sold anything and everything by village standards. So we had a small grocery shop, which we called the general dealer. We used to sell fat cakes and other things. And it appears like of my siblings, I'm the one who did the worst jobs, because after school, even at primary, and we don't call it child labor, I was, <laughs> I was required to go and sell vegetables in the market. But during those days, vegetables were consumed by what in the village we call sophisticated people. So teachers and nurses, they're the ones who understood about tomatoes and spinach and cabbage, and these are the things that I sold. I used to give them accounts and come and collect at month end, you know, when they got their salary. So I guess that's where I started learning and practicing my first business. But of course I hated it, you know, when I'll be carrying this box in town and I saw other people who were at high school, at primary, particularly handsome boys, exactly. <laughs> you know, I didn't know whether to take this box and throw it away or exactly what to do with it. And then I went to a, in Botswana, it was common to go to boarding senior secondary schools. So a lot of the ladies around you that I think will get a time to also later just quickly introduce themselves, they went to boarding high schools. And it is at boarding high school that we made our friends, we bonded, and we learned to be women, to get up and make up our own beds, to do our laundry, unlike the now sophisticated high schools where they do laundry for them and iron. During our days, we did our own laundry and ironing. Then from there, I was fortunate enough for my parents to send me to the United States to study at Morgan State University in Baltimore, where I was a double major study, studying accounting and economics, then went back home, and I started working at the Bank of Botswana, which is like your reserve bank. In the process of working, I got a scholarship from the African American Institute, AAI where I did my master's at the University of Cincinnati with the scholarship. And I went back and continued working for the bank, resigned the bank and worked for an oil company, a BP. And I left BP after working for them for six years and went back home and studied law at the University of Botswana. So I studied law and then I opened my own law firm. I'm both a lawyer, a condenser, and a notary public. And, uh, it was during those days when I studied law that I developed a passion to actively participate in politics. So in 1999, I ran for parliament and I won a seat and I was fortunate to hold three ministerial portfolios starting at the office of the president and at the Ministry of Wildlife. It was called Trade Industry, Wildlife and Tourism. And then from there, I went to the Ministry of Works, Transport, and Communication. So I worked five years in government. Of course, I lost the next elections. And uh, I then uh, went back to the private sector. But I was fortunate because even in the private sector, I still worked with government. I was appointed to the board 
of the, the Bank of Botswana, where I had worked for five years. And then I was also chairing the government uh, labor advisory committee, which advises government on ILO, International Labor Organization compliance, whether our law was in line with the statutes that we had uh, signed to be a party to. And in that, I also became a chairperson, which I think is relevant here, of the women's wing of the ruling party. So I, I did that job for two years. I had previously served in that committee and in the youth committee in different capacities. So yes, I am a politician. Uh, it has trained me quite a lot, uh, especially for tolerance. Because when you are a politician, all sorts of things are labeled at you. When the newspapers want to sell their newspapers, if they have your face with a negative uh, headline in the front, then they know by 4 o'clock all the newspapers are gone. So I think for women in leadership, in politics, you need to learn also, although you continue and you must continue, we are made different from men, so we must continue to, re to retain our feminine touch, but we know we work in a men's world, so we must develop a thick skin where thick skin is needed and cry and talk where crying and talking is needed. <laughs> and, uh, but above all, the power of women that I enjoy more than anything else is the support. If you have girlfriends, you know they can always cover your back and you know they don't really need much from you except your honesty, your dedication. So as we gather today and share experiences and ideas, I would just like to say to most people in this room who happen to be younger than me, that find a soulmate who you can always rely on. They don't have to be the same class and status as yourself. Let's get rid ourselves of uh, petty jealousies and know that by opening your mouth to another woman, you can find that your burden and your problem is lighter. And, you know, God always enriches those who are genuine. If you try to do things and you are not yourself, and you are not honest about what you do, it doesn't matter, you can work like you don't know, nothing would become of it. But when you do something, and we will err as people because we are human, we are not God, but erring in good faith, erring believing that what you are doing, you are doing it in honesty and with all the love, you know God would forgive you and would always continue to bless you and you will grow. Thank you much. Thank you for coming and good night. No. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I mean, can I get an amen on all that? I wanted to lift that right to a Delta meeting, a Jack and Jill meeting, a, a, a Alpha Kappa Alpha. All meetings of women need that speech right there. Thank you so much. Um, I will uh, dominate the microphone if you let me. So I'm first going to say, um, who would like to ask a question? I'm going to do that after every time we ask a question so that I'm not the only person asking questions. Do we have any questions? Wonderful. I'll be right over there. Madam Minister, Madam Ambassador, Adrian, I had the privilege of visiting Botswana with the ambassador back in March on the education mission. And several of us uh, also went for a business mission as well. And to the sister's point, Ambassador or Madam Minister, can you speak to the caring for of elders that occurs in Botswana culture? The ambassador took us to her mother's home, her mother's land, and there was a woman, and I don't want to tell the story wrong, I hope that you will share the story, there was a woman that lived on her property, 
that have been living there for many, many years. And I think that it would speak to your point about us caring for, continuing to care for our elders. Because you know, in this country, we've got a lot of nursing homes. We've got a lot of old folks homes. You don't see a lot of that in Botswana. So if you could speak to, and please tell just a little bit of that story about the young woman that lives on your property. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> First and foremost, I want all of you, when you leave um, this property today, I wish not to hear any of you talking about Africa. There is no such a thing called Africa. There are countries in Africa. Talk about Botswana, talk about Kenya, talk about Tanzania, talk about Nigeria. Because if you talk about Africa, Firstly, it clouds your mind. When you talk about Africa, it is equivalent to Africa equals negativity. Africa equals poverty. Africa equals war. Africa equals corruption. All the negative things that you can talk about. Today, I'm here to share with you that Botswana equals success. Botswana equals diamonds. Botswana equals tourism. Botswana equals education. The government of Botswana provides free education from primary to university to every citizen, regardless of whether you have a parent or you don't have a parent. Secondly, Botswana is the model country for how orphans particularly orphans left with HIV AIDS are cared for. These children are put in homes, not alone in homes. Some relative extended family cares for these children, but government checks on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, there is food provided for this orphan. There are uniforms, school uniforms. Teachers are sensitized to that this is a special child, and special health care is given to this child. In a lot of African countries, before colonialization, extended families worked. Today, they still work, but not as effectively as they used to. When my mother was sick, I nursed her for over three years, taking her to different specialists, to hospital, and all the ladies, all of them that you see in this room, without exception, without exception, if any of their mothers or their fathers were sick in the village, because a lot of us still have our parents in the village, they would take them away from the village and come and nurse them in their houses, which are some of them better than this house, if I may say. <laughs> so. The extended family structure still works in Botswana, but it doesn't get rid of the fact that you still need homes where the old people can be together and share and give each other company. Because yes, most of us have helpers in our houses, but all the women that you see here, we are working women. We get up at five o'clock, drop the children at school, go to work, and then we don't come back until five, six o'clock, some at eight o'clock in the evening. So certainly, when you have a parent like that, it's almost like you can put them somewhere, you check on them, and then over the weekend, when you have more time, you bring them into the house because then you know you'll spend more time with them. But of course, we have people who help, and sometimes, Others are lucky to have an aunt or a cousin who is not uh, having a formal job to come and, um, and spend most of the time there and you'll care for both of them. But let me assure you that all of us, even though we are from villages, in Botswana, when you go to Botswana during the long weekends, and long weekends we mean long holidays, Easter, Christmas, the towns are like ghost towns. All of us enjoy the village life. We go there where we go barefoot, where we drink the local brew, and just let it all hang out. 
you know, and, and, and let your hair down if you like, you know, cut out the nail polish, the lipstick, and just be with the people, you know, and kill chicken and eat and celebrate. So uh, I think that's what happens in Botswana, but the ladies are here that are going to be adding and commenting and correcting because I don't want it to be just myself and the minister. When I was a young girl, probably about uh, eight years old, there's a lady who came to work for my parents. Uh, and then later, as we grew older, we discovered that she too had her own children. This lady has been staying with us since I was eight years old. So my father passed on about seven years back. My mother was a farmer, so most of the time she wasn't even in the, in the village, but she was in the plowing areas. So she doesn't, she didn't, this lady who stays with us didn't like plowing lands. So she didn't want to go and stay with my mother. There. So she has a, a house of her own within the complex. And then about in 2009, my mother passed away. We tried to say to her, please, we would look after you when you are with the children. Because my parents' house in the village, there's no one who is staying there. We go there when there's something in the village. And we go there when we are on leave. It's a fairly comfortable house. It's a fairly comfortable yard. But we have our life in town. We are hustling and trying to do things. So after my mother passed away in 2009, we tried to say to her, why don't you go to your children? And we would look after you on a monthly basis, but at least you'd be with your children. She refused. She says, my parents, her parents, meaning our parents, because she's like our big sister, even though now she's a, grand, she's a grandmother herself. So she said, I was left here, and I'm going to die here where I was left by the parents. I cannot leave this yard, and it just looks like there's no one who even cares for it. But luckily for us, we have another sister, this girl, my mother got her to be married to one of our farm's four men. They divorced with the husband. She has her yard a stone throw away from our yard. It is a one minute walk from her yard to my parents' house. So I, we give the money to this girl to make sure that there is meat, there is relish, they soap, anything that the lady has uh, that she might need. So at least we check her through this other girl to say, is she fine or whatever. Uh, I was telling um, some of the delegates that today is what is Saturday? <laughs> yes, my aunt was getting buried today. This is my mother's elder sister, my mother's real elder sister. But because I have all these delegates here, I couldn't just leave them to go to the funeral. But because this lady is in our house, who is no blood relationship of ours except by association and long life, if it was her who had died, I would not be here. Because as the eldest member of our family, I would have to make sure that she's buried properly and she's done properly. So yes, but to the point of what about the old people in the village? It's a very important point. I always say to people, sometimes we look at people and we say, oh, this one has no love. You can't give what you don't have. So if you have love, you dish is freely because you have it. So if we work hard and we empower ourselves, empower each other, we will automatically go back to the villages and empower the people in the villages. But we must care for them, but we must also find out what works. Because it doesn't mean that because it works in Botswana, it's going to work in Jamaica. It doesn't mean because it works in South Africa, it's going to work in Namibia. Minister. Um, 
she's taken care of all the topics that are on the table. I think I'm just going to say one or two things. And before I say them, I just want all the women that are in this room from Botswana, who are CEOs, who are MDs, who are uh, heads of whatever, please just stand up for a minute. Thank you. You can sit. I wanted to just show you how normal it is in Botswana for women to become leaders. I think our mindset when we think, and I think I speak for all of us, we think human being first, woman second. Because if you regard yourself as a human being in a race, you do not leave anything out that we believe is for men. That is why they are heading financial services, they are heading big banks, they are heading the investment uh, wing of government, they are heading tourism, they are heading everything. Because it is so normal for us just to be go-getter human beings who just by accident have it to be women. That's a very important lesson for us. Secondly, our culture in a way determines what we have become. Our culture is such that we still believe in the extended family, the value of the extended family. Sometimes you are own detriment because uh, I would meet uh, Tebelelo in Washington and I'll say she's my auntie and I'll try to trace back, you know, there will not even be an ounce, but because we come, because she comes from the same village as my mother, we happen to, we then associate and therefore it, it, it brings us together. And we still try to, to, to cherish that, we still try to, to live by that even today, despite the fact that it is challenging and in what we do. The third thing that I just want to share with you as a lesson, and it is a lesson because there's people of color here. When you go and work in the private sector and you work with other people of color and they happen to be senior to you, one of the things that I learned at a very early age was never to let them understand the, ex the extent to which I was happy about how much they paid me. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, when you get that fat check of a million bucks as a bonus, smile, but don't smile too much. Go to the loo, take off your shoes, scream if you wish, but they should not know the extent to which you are happy about it. Because that, that determines the level of which, the level that you think you are worth. And they will forever know to what extent they can make you, they can pay you, and you will be happy with that. Because the minute when they don't realize how to read you out, they will forever be overpaying you. Okay? And they wouldn't even realize that they're paying you. So I just thought I'll just share those few lessons because they have worked. For me, it's a question of mindset. Uh, human being first, woman second. Never let them know to the extent to which you are happy about what they're paying you. And, and, and uh, live by the extended family value because your blood will always take care of you better than non-blood. Wow, Words of wisdom. Does anybody have any questions? Sure. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Toy Banks. I'm an image specialist and motivational speaker. I have a question. I see so many uh, women in leadership from Botswana, which is absolutely amazing. What's also amazing to me and my friends from Michigan uh, is that uh, you are women of faith as well. One of the problems that we face here in America is that women who are in leadership have a very serious problem with balancing leadership at home, as you mentioned briefly early, uh, with managing leadership in the office and balancing leadership at home. And so the men are complaining about women who make more money than, more money than them that they come home acting like the man. I, want, I heard some things about the culture of the marriages and the respect for the Botswana women to their husbands. Can you explain uh, to us your culture and uh, how you honor and respect your men? Excellent question. Good afternoon, ladies. Uh, my name is Tiny Katwane. I, I work for a company called Bifum in Botswana. Happily married woman. I've been working very hard for a number of years. 
and not apologizing about my work, my social life, my love for golf, my love for hanging out with a lot of my friends and having fun. <laughs> I think that's the basic principle. I believe that sometimes there's a misconception that because our elders fought for equal rights, when there were no equal rights at the time, we keep on fighting a fight that shouldn't be there. I always say, I love being looked after by men. I don't want to go home and be a man. I want to go home and throw my shoes down and let the man give me a glass of wine. What's wrong with it? <laughs> What's wrong with it? So on that basis, ladies, Sometimes we put ourselves in an uncomfortable situation by trying to compete when we don't have to compete. Let's be ourselves. Let's be leaders in the offices. You know when you leave your office and you go to church, some of us take a back seat and pray. We don't even care about being noticed that we're there because we're there for a totally different reason. We're not there to show our positions. So I think for me it's around accepting that you're a lady working hard and, and acknowledging that you are a human being and enjoying yourself. So there's no reason for us to be fighting. Let's just work hard, but go home and have fun. I say men need to hear that speech from her right there. American men. But th this is where the but is. I still believe that we have a challenge as, um, as a nation uh, because we have done so well in terms of edu educating our girl child to be what they want to be. So our girl child is coming out so strong, ready for the world, ready to be anything. You've just seen they are anything they want to be. And to some extent, this is just my view, that we haven't done as well with the boy child. So the boy child is still trying to fight uh, for a position for power because we, we've still told them that the world is their oyster, they will be rulers, and, and in reality it doesn't necessarily happen. And therefore they struggle with that. So you'll find that there is quite a number of successful women in Botswana, and I'm sure in other countries, that are either not married or divorced. Because when, <laughs> two examples, uh, but because, uh, because of those dynamics of readiness or lack thereof, uh, because the girl child has excelled much more than the boy child. And if you were to ask me what is it that needs to be done, we need to reaffirm and educate our boy child to become just as, as happy with themselves as the girl child. That is where the challenge is. So that, I will have to stand up, ladies, because... Before you, you are seeing an example and a model of a divorced woman. You know, I don't want to keep it away from you. Maybe you have a brother or something, or something <laughs> that you could start talking. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when, thank you, when God has endowed you with blessings, you also have to know that you can't have it all. And you need to be comfortable. It used to be even in our country. When a child fell pregnant and was not married, the parents, at least in our church, were excommunicated from church because it was a sign that you didn't bring them up well. Secondly, it used to be our education policy in the country that when a child fell pregnant, and we did have a lot of issues of teenage pregnancy, then they didn't come back to school until government said, listen, let's be realistic and let's be practical. So now what happens in our education system? When a child falls pregnant, then they are given chance to go and give birth, and then they are allowed to go to another school for stigma or to get away from stigma and continue their education. We have a lot of, you know, 
I think most of the time we don't realize our power as women. Because all these men were brought us by uh, they were brought up by us. So it is ourselves who must accept the blame in Botswana when the man dies, especially if he's rich. Oh, you know that woman, what did she do to him? <laughs> he is always the poor soul. When there is divorce, it's always, oh, you know that woman, she talks too much. The poor man couldn't even bear it. So I think we need to also make sure that we are not ashamed about things that we can change. After I was divorced, when I would go to a funeral alone or go to a reception alone, I just felt so bad as if they are thinking I'm looking for somebody's husband. <laughs> Until I just said, listen, this is your situation, deal with it. So what did I do? I'm now comfortable in my shoes. I still am not comfortable to eat at a restaurant alone. <laughs> uh, but I am saying all of this to say, you will rather have a daughter who is divorced and go through stigma than to have a daughter who is dying in an unhappy relationship. So the family, the family is important. We must encourage our children to get married. Ladies, we must encourage the men to still be the head of the household. It is done by God. We must do it like that. But listen, if it ain't working, it ain't working. So it is now our duty as women to educate the boy child, like the minister was saying. We need, when we wake up children in the morning, to wake up all the children. We need to say to our boy child, make up your bed. We need to say to our boy child, open the door for your sister. We need to say to our boy child, recognize a woman when she stands up. Because if we do that and we do it well, we are creating future better husbands. Thank you. I think the women um, of Botswana and the women of the United States have a lot in common. Is that not, is not the case? You got, I'm, I got one more question here, and then we're going to have one last question after this. This is a very sensitive issue for me, but um, uh, I'm South African and uh, a proud one to, to be with my African sisters here this afternoon. Um, What's impressed mainly upon my heart about women is when, say for instance, we African women come in, into America, we crossing cultures, and it's, it's, it's very difficult, and I know somebody's gonna answer this and they're gonna answer it really well, because most of us as Af African women that are single or, or looking to make a life in America, come in with this perception that it's different, it's nice, it's exciting. And then when you get into it, you think the grass is green on the other side, but it's not. Yeah. And then the American women look at us as a threat and say, wow, they're coming in and they're taking our men because we look different and, and, and we, more, uh, we are more subservient and we um, cook and we clean. And this, as soon as the doors opened, I mean, this is something that I've done. Like I would get into the kitchen, take, kick off my shoes, get into the kitchen, kitchen, wash my hands, and prepare dinner. And so it, it was different. And I, we, we tend to spoil the American men. But they don't get that all in some of the homes, not all, in some of their homes. And so we've come in, we've taken this, but they don't appreciate it. How do we merge that too so that we can um, so that we can learn more and not get into situations like that. And then we can all work together with the American women, say that we're not coming in, but this is what we have. This is our perception and this is what uh, we can offer because this is what we learned back home to take care of your men. We're not doing anything that's, that's different. 
that we haven't learned. So help us to understand each other and we, how we could work through that. Thank you. Oh, we might need a couple of days to answer that question. Um, <laughs> I'm going to kick off my shoes when I get home and get right in the bed because I'm tired. <laughs> and, every, and everybody has to fend for themselves tonight. That's what's happening in my house. Do you want to answer, take a stab at that? Anybody, anybody want to take a stab at that? I think it's I think it's a simple one. You know, generalizations are generally very, uh, very dangerous. Um, and and I think uh, one issue does not necessarily define a nation or a group of of people. So it's a difficult one in the sense that I don't necessarily believe it affects all. I don't necessarily believe it's an African versus uh, American. You know, it is a, a straightforward issue of boy child versus girl child, what you do uh, to try and retain that relationship and have equitable status, not equality, because we can never achieve equality. You know, women, uh, men can't breastfeed children, whether we like it or not. So we are looking for equity rather than equality. And equity is a much richer version of equality. It's more a question of doing the right things at the right uh, levels, etc. So I think Let's leave it at that. Otherwise, there will be a war just about to erupt here. <laughs> <laughs> the, ministers ha the minister has answered the question and has answered it fully. But let me tell you the reality. Men, they're going to be taken by anyone and by anyone where they want to be taken. In Botswana, we have a lot of men who came here, studied here. They are with American wives, some white, some yellow. We have uh, people married, Australian, what, what, what. So I think let's not make an issue about what is not an issue, but not only that. If they come here and they, how many African women really would they take? You are talking about a drop in the ocean. And anyway, along the line, somebody is going to drop, somebody is going to pick. <laughs> Having to leave my children to travel. I think despite all that, even today it still pains me to leave my kids because I've got four boys. The youngest one being seven, twins being 11, and the oldest one being 19. The most difficult is just to leave them behind. Everything else I can deal with. Um, for me, the most difficult time of my career and I think it still continues to, to be a challenge. I love family. I love extended family. And I have a lot of relatives around this room, some through marriage, some through birth. And they know that there is hardly, hardly any funeral that I don't attend when I'm at home. I will put everything aside to go and be supportive, either by being there, by working, by cooking. I think it's just part of my makeup. And to be here and have people that I love that I can't bury is difficult. But it's not just by being here. My name, I'm named after my aunt. You know, your junior kind of thing if it was a man. And when I was member of parliament one time, this aunt, my father's uh, sister, passed away. And we were debating in parliament until 5 o'clock in the morning. Because the bill at the time before the parliament, I'm the one as minister who had put the bill, and I had to respond to it. And the debate went on until very late. And the president said to his guy, take her with my helicopter to go and attend the funeral. 
So I told the people at home that, please, I'm on my way. When we got home, tried to land, it was too foggy and too dangerous to land. So the people at the funeral could see us circling. It was misty and misty and misty. Eventually, when we landed, the coffin was being taken down. Now, that was difficult for me. And the other difficult one, again, and I think a lot of my country people don't even know this one. We had a law to introduce a law to say people should not kill lions when they kill their livestock. Because in Botswana, if an animal kills your livestock, because we are cattle farmers, people had the right to kill. So we came with a law to say don't kill we are protecting the lions because they are becoming extinct. So I had to go addressing meetings, telling farmers that when this cow, when your cow is killed, don't touch the lion. I needed protection from the police because the farmers were angry. And I had to stand up. 300, 400 people and say, yes, I'm telling you that if you kill those lions, I'm going to throw you in jail. Now, I mean, this is this young girl telling this old people, and they're saying, if my child is sick, can I sell a lion? Because you are saying these lions are ours. That was tough. And before every meeting, I used to pray and say, God, they're going to kill me, but give me the power. <laughs> You know, and they drew cartoons of me saying, kill the cattle, protect the lions. <laughs> but you know, to the credit of my country people, eventually they understood. And now when they see tourism and people coming to see the lions, and most people don't know how tough that was. It was like the leadership. They threw me in the deep end and say, go and tell them not to kill the lion. That was tough. But eventually, when you succeed, all is well. That ends well. Ladies, thank you so much. You, you, if it's quick, we'll do it quickly. OK. And then that's the champagne popping. Yay, because that's what's coming next. So we're going to take this question very quickly, and then the champagne toast. It's a 30 second comment and um, it's from, I'm Dahlia Myers and I am from South Carolina and have known Adrian and Marima since we were all teenagers. And I wanted to stand to say, I could not be prouder of them and having this delegation. I've seen women from Botswana who are so self-possessed. They dance on the dance floor like nobody's watching. We Americans are always so afraid. And I couldn't care if you all had sat me on the grass today. There is nowhere else I would have rather been. So thank you, Botswana delegation. Mariah, Adrian, you know I love you. But thank you all so much. This was outstanding. And I am more amazed than I have been in maybe 30 years. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. If, if ladies would just um, sit, and we are going to um, close out the program, but if you would just stay at your tables, and even the ladies that are in the chairs sitting, we're going to pour champagne at the tables first, and then we're going to bring glasses to everybody else, and we'll bring your glasses um, to you here. And while we're doing that, we're just going to have a presentation from Jillian Blackwell from My Girlfriend's Business International to the Ambassador. Go ahead. First of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, first of all, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity, Minister, Minister. We, first of all, we want to say that we had an opportunity to meet the ambassador in Detroit at a round table. Um, we were so impressed with her, and she's doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And we wanted to come to support her and what she's doing all the way from the Motor City. Detroit, Michigan, and um, I'm a representative from our Atlanta network. 
Um, what we want to do today is make a proclamation. We run an organization called My Girlfriend's Business. My Girlfriend's Business was established by Christian women who just happen to be women, but absolutely love God and are not afraid to express the fact that they love God in their business. Um, I want to introduce to you again, my, I am Jillian Blackwell. I am affectionately called Chief Girlfriend, and I say that um, very humbly, and I'm going to mention uh, why we're, I'm emphasizing Chief Girlfriend. I stand next to me, um, Latasha Brown, who is our uh, representative in the state of Atlanta, I mean, the state of Georgia, but our representative for international affairs. And then I have this beautiful woman here who is our director of image branding. You can tell she is a beautiful woman. So anything you do, uh, we want to do in excellence. So we have a proclamation here that we want to read. And uh, my girlfriend all the way from Louisiana, Louisiana wrote this out for us. Can you hold that for me? On July 21st, 2012, we, the women of My Girlfriend's Business International, proclaim Her Excellence, Madam Ambassador, Chief Girlfriend of Botswana. <laughs> Chief Girlfriend of Botswana. This proclamation is made because of your dedication to help other women in business throughout the world. You have been strategic in your call to lead business missions with the goal of promoting Botswana and bringing investors to your great nation. My Girlfriend's Business International believes the following. We'll make this really briefly. We believe every success is a prayer success and every failure is a prayer failure. We pray every morning at 5 o'clock in the morning with other women across the nation. We believe in partnering with other women in business to strengthen our families, businesses, and our community. We believe in promoting other businesses so that they can expand their businesses and pro prosper financially. Want to say that. Go ahead. With your commitment to the success and growth in women-owned businesses, you have proven, I don't have my glasses on, you have proven to be an invaluable asset to the international expansion of my girlfriend's business, and we are proud to welcome you as Chief Girlfriend of Baswama. My <laughs> Lastly, we would like to salute you and join in our arms with you. And <laughs> Chief Girlfriend, thank you so much. And we do have a quick salute from Tasha, Latasha Brown. Go ahead, Latasha. So, Ambassador, thank you and Minister for coming. And when we're talking about women and grandmothers, um, I had a grandmother who, um, I'm from Alabama, and lived in rural Alabama, and she would often, her gift would be singing. So, and she would always have these spirituals um, to really talk about as a woman changing. Um, and I just want to uh, just leave you with this. I know I've been changed. I Oh Lord, I, I know I've been changed. You know the angels in heaven done sign my name. Thank you, sister. <laughs> title, Chief Girlfriend. <laughs> Thank you for honoring me. Thank you. You know, they always say when somebody calls you by nickname, it's because they love you. You don't call anybody by nickname if you don't love them. So I can feel the love from toe, from head to toe. I can sing. Thank you for the beautiful voice, but you know what? I can get down. Yeah. I can dance. Thank you. We know. We saw it for our own eyes. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, very much. What we're going to do now is we're going to close the program with a, with a prayer by uh, um, Sister Natasha is going to come up and...
But you want to do the toast first. Okay. So then we are going to first do the toast. And uh, we're going to hand that over to, is it the ambassador who is going to do the toast? Okay. Well, we're going to hand that over to you to do a toast. To, uh, so, oh, you know what? We're going to let the minister do a toast. Okay. We're going to let the ambassador do a toast. We're gonna let the <laughs> I'm just going to say whatever they say to do. <laughs> Ladies, up. Uh, everybody has a glass? Okay. Please, everybody should have a glass. Uh, can I propose a toast, ladies? First and foremost, to my Honorable Minister, Dokas Makatomalesu, it is not often that you reach out to a minister and you say, listen, I have this thing, this is my vision, and she takes you up. She had absolute choice and absolute discretion not to lead this delegation. And by her taking the time out to come and lead this delegation, it has not only helped for people to respect me, to know that I bring out ministers, and when I call, you come, but also, <laughs> but also to give credence to the business people who have spent their hard-earned dollars to fly all the way to live in hotels and to spend their money to come and share with you. To the minister. Yes. Lastly, to all of you girlfriends, especially <laughs> chief girlfriends, for taking out time to come and show and share that the problems of us as women, that the problems of us, the problems of the world, we should take complete ownership to, for if we work together, we work hard, we are the ones who are the future. We are the ones who can solve them to the world. And the last toast, which where I will then say, start drinking. <laughs> It's to the cordial and continued relationship between, firstly, the Botswana sisters and the American sisters, and secondly, to the country of Botswana and to the country of the United States, and lastly, to all of you and to your good health, to your health, Amen. Minister. Amen. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. One of the things that we have discussed this afternoon is that we're in a room filled with praying women, whether they're in America or in Botswana. So for this portion of the program, we're going to have a prayer to close out this event. And I'd like to have the minister and the ambassador please stand in the middle. All women touch and agree around the room. As we prepare our hearts and minds to close out in what we'll call our benediction, I just wanted to bring to bear one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, which is in the book of Numbers. In this story, five daughters come to claim their inheritance. Mm. Their father has died. They're in a time where no women inherit property. No women inherit money. But they come together, and their five names have significance. And just as in many in Botswana and many African countries, a name is significant. I, too, believe the same, and so do the Israelites. And their names were Mala, which means infirmity, Noah, which means wandering, Hagla, which means dancing for joy, Milka, which means queen, and Tirza, which means well-pleasing. These five women went to Moses and said, yes, our father has died, and all those who are going to inherit are men but we want what is rightfully ours. Yes. Moses then goes to God and says, the Lord, these women have come to claim something that they claim is theirs. And God said back to Moses, what they said is right. Mm. And he said, give them what they have requested. And not only that, change the law of the land mm. so that the generations that come after are blessed because these five women were bold. Now, they're revolutionary not just because they changed the law, but because all five women were different. 
All five women came from different walks of life. They were related by blood, but some were wanderers, some were joy-filled, some were queens, some were favorable and well-pleasing. They were all different. Some from Botswana, some from Valdosta, some from Atlanta, South Carolina, Alabama. Speaking different tongues, some Setswana, some English. But they all came and went before those who claimed to have power and claimed what was rightfully theirs. So today, as we offer the blessing and the close, we offer and ask and beseech our God to bless the revolutionary woman, the woman who looks at tradition and says that might be how it has always been done. But from this day forward, I claim what is mine despite tradition, despite limitations, despite what others have always told me. So I'm not going to war with one another. We might wear pearls and hats today, but we can get down, have fun, get over petty rivalries, come together and claim the wealth that our Lord has created us to claim. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come this day beseeching your presence. God, we know we come from different walks of life, different experiences, divorced, married, single, with child and without, asking this day that you bless our hands. Establish the work of our hands. Bless our coming and our going. Bless us, O oh God, in the city and in the village. Bless us whether we are over 60 or under 30. God, we come right now knowing that you've created us to do great things, for you have promised that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You took such care that while we were in the womb of our mothers, you knit us together, sinew by sinew, muscle to bone, brain, heart, and lungs. You took care that every unique experience we have gone through can be used for your glory. And we come as the five daughters of Zelophehad came from different walks of life. Some in here are despondent and discouraged. Some have already been victorious. Some of us coming just to see what's next. But we all come now to your altar, claiming that we are those you have created for such a time as this. So as we lift up Chief Girlfriend Ambassador, and as we lift up Minister Dorcas, we not only lift them up, but we lift the women that they lift, which includes each of us today. For as we are lifted, help us to lift others. Help us, God, not to be blessed just in the workplace or the political space. But as we go forth and become and do what you've called and created each of us to do and to be, bless our homes. God, give us the priceless blessings, the ones we could never pay for, the joy unspeakable, the peace that surpasses all understanding, the healthy child, the finances, God, that only you can provide for us. Allow our marriages, our relationships, our mothers and fathers to be blessed by our doing what you've called us to do. Grant us safe travels as we leave this place. Continue to turn our face towards you. And we will do everything by our thoughts, our words, and our deeds to give you all the glory and all the honor. As I close in a name that is the power of my faith, I invite each of you to close this blessing and prayer in the tradition of your faith. For it is in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, who equips, provides, uplifts, and directs that we pray. And together we all said, amen, amen. 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 Hug your sister. <laughs>